Hello and welcome back to Continental Club. Yes, we are back on a Thursday afternoon to bring you your Continental Club opinions and analysis. Joining me is Henry Hill and Michael McCubbin. Henry, round two of the Champions League is up and running. We are oh, filming yes. this on a Wednesday due to the fact we can't film on a Thursday, unfortunately, because McCubbs is on TV tomorrow morning doing the Sky Sports News shift. Anyway, we are filming this on a Wednesday, but we saw a dramatic night of Champions League action on Tuesday, didn't we, Henry? Mm. Yeah, you know what? I uh, I looked at the early fixtures, which was like Braga versus Union. away at Union, yeah. and then the other one, Sociedad, Salzburg. I was like, oh dear. But actually, after my run, I sat down. I was like, yeah, oh, sod it. Put on the Union Berlin game, and it was great. Chose well. It, yeah. it was just end to end, zero defending, all action. Becker, great goals, and then but then Bruma's goal. To draw level at 2 2 was cool. Then the winner, my housemate and I both yelped with excitement. Yeah. <laughs> when, uh, what a finish. Because when it was like a corner. Yeah, Union thought, Berlin had a corner. Yeah, I thought, oh, here we go, last chance. And go down the other end. It reminded me of Schmiech's goal in the Champions League final yeah. where mm. Liverpool um, won part of the comeback. Kind of like a daisy cutter. Mm. Yeah, and I just really enjoyed it. So, But yeah, to see the. I know they're complaining about the Olympic Stadion being the home of uh, their games. It is, a, it is a bit ridiculous. But at the same time, it was rocking. Seventy-three thousand Union fans in there. That's at least like fifty thousand who wouldn't have probably been able to see that game otherwise. So you know, things to think about. But yeah, that's the most busy I've seen the Olympic Stadion in club football in a very long time. Good yeah, to see it bouncing. Absolutely. Since the two thousand and six World Cup final, probably. So. There we have it. There we have it. What a final that was as well. <laughs> let's let's uh, get Mikey. Let's get Mikey in. So. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Ralph, I thought Ralph Sostad was also brilliant against yeah. RB Salzburg as well, causing them so many issues. Love that. Love that side. Uh, really enjoying watching them. McCubs, though, difficult night. Act. Oh, for United, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, that or group... Or you just already put it behind you by the sounds of things? Uh, yeah, I put it behind me about you're five also, minutes You're after. actually very good at bouncing back from defeats. I think more so than any other member of the team, potentially. I thought yeah, you meant United. It... I was going to say they've lost no, quite no, a lot. No, no, not, <laughs> not them. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I just very quickly choose not to care. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's my only coping mechanism. Um, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, it was just a bit of a calamitous last 30 minutes, really. I think um, that United definitely had the chances to, to win it before then. Uh, but, you know, credit Gal- Galatasaray have, you know, come back in two games now. They've, they've clearly got a really good spirit about them. Um, I thought Icardi, although he, he was not very good for the first 70 minutes of the game, really came alive in the last 20. Um, yeah, I think that, that group is actually quite tough. You know, you think about, Copenhagen causing Gala all sorts of problems in, in game week one could have beaten Bayern Munich easily on, on Tuesday night um, so yeah I, th- I think you there, there's no way you can back United to get through that group now they've got to host, they've got to host Copenhagen and they've got to go away to Copenhagen and then they've got to go away to Galatasaray by the time they play Bayern on the final day um, unless they've got unless they've got at least seven points on the board I think it's going to be tough for them Um so, yeah, but it's it, yeah, so it's really yeah. I think it was quite a, a group that when you first looked at it, it was kind of like oh may, maybe there'll be some problems, but you, you know, a, a, a Premier League club should be able to get through that. But clearly, that's not the case. Gallism. I think. Gala's first win in British soil in their history. It's crazy, isn't it? I'm, I'm actually quite <laughs> English, surprised at that. Um, but I guess yeah, I guess their home record usually stands up for itself. Um, but also, I mean, Arsenal losing to Lens as well. I mean, I think um, you know. It's easy to, and I was reading somewhere as well, I think so far this season in Europe, England are the sixth, ranked 16th in the coefficient for like Not getting results, that fifth results, Champions League results, spot results, the moment, in, in Europe. I think Croatia are ahead, I think Greece are ahead. English clubs have been, yeah, poor so far this year. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the only club you can really guarantee going through at this moment is, is Man City, you'd think. Um, I think Arsenal, well, I think Arsenal will see, still yeah. make it through. Wait till Leipzig tonight. I still, yeah, who knows, who knows. I think, I think, Arsenal will still make it through, but no one's expecting them to lose to Lons. I know they've had an uptick in form, but generally they've been poor this season. Yeah, great goals from Lons, by the way. Yeah. Both of them, really fun. Bouncing that stadium. Just quickly on the Napoli-Real Madrid game, Mm. lots of Spanish press saying that Bellingham's goal should be nominated for the Puskas. 
Can I just get your takes on that? Because nah, it was, I think it's it was a good goal. <laughs> it was not, I mean, yeah. I, I think it's a good goal, but Puskas is, is outrageous, to be honest. He just bundles through. He's, he's so physical and like they can't get the ball off him, but it's not a great technical goal. Like All the dribbling's quite untidy, I think. Yeah. Uh, the finish is nice. The finish is yeah, really finish nice, is really but good. I don't think it's it, it's not a great goal. Yeah, I agree. Um, I thought, yeah, the, the Braga goal that we just mentioned, who scored it again? Bruma. Bruma, that was it. Um, thought that was the, the goal of the night, to be quite honest. But the Napoli-Real Madrid game was really, really good fun actually Napoli caused them a number of issues although the scoreline probably didn't reflect uh, that you know it looked tighter than it was potentially because that was an outrageous outrageous penalty yeah. given against Nacho there was also a shocking handball decision in that severe PSV game as well just proves that not all the issues are assigned to the Premier League there are other issues in <laughs> the competition they're, 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 as well they surely will surely that handball rule just needs to be changed it, it seems quite simple like surely got to happen. Just get it done. Get it yeah. done. Although I do like semi-automated offsides, really coming in handy. Yeah. Uh, although I did rule out that spectacular goal from Hoyland, who must have been one of the players of the day. Yeah, good. Uh, mm. You know, less said about Onana's performance, the better. But Hoyland was absolutely sensational. Three goals already in the Champions League. Uh, really, really impressive stuff. Uh, we will talk about the Champions League in Europe throughout the show. But actually, what we wanted to talk about today was the sort of secrets behind some of the most underrated clubs in Europe. Because actually, you look around the league tables of Europe, and firstly, most of them are incredibly tight right now. And secondly, there's just a few teams that no one really expected to be up there at this stage of the season. And no one really exemplifies that better my Cubs than Stuttgart because, mm. you know, they nearly got relegated last year and they're in the lofty places right now. Yeah, nearly got relegated last year, nearly got relegated the year before. Um, I know, like, in that... 2021 when they came up they you know they I think they finished ninth and were really impressive throughout the season um but uh but yeah I think no one expected them to, to be where they are right now and they're fully deserving of that third place in the bully at the moment um sorry they're second sorry um in the bully at the moment um after after the Bayern draw I forget that uh but they're third in terms of goals scored only Leverkusen and Bayern have uh have outscored them um, and yeah like I said they're well worth it they rank third in the league for expected goals they rank second for expected goals against um, also what's mad all but one of the 19 goals they've scored has come in open play wow. so it, that's, great. Like that, that's by far the most in the Bundesliga and I know you know like set pieces are really important but I think it just goes to show the overall Stuttgart's overall play under Hernus um, has been really really superb mm. um you know they've, they've been a, a really good team to watch um you know when you look at their kind of they, they've got a really good um variety to their play you know they're directly you know they, they rank quite high for direct attacks they also rank quite high for kind of possess more possession based attacks where there's more than kind of 10 passes um in play um and I guess they, the one blot has been that 5-1 loss to Leipzig early on in the season but aside from that they've yeah, been so impressive. You know, they beat Freiburg 5-0, they beat Bochum 5-0 and most of the clubs they played, I think aside from Freiburg, have been in the bottom half of the table um, so far. So they have had a bit of an easy run, but I mean, you can't really be judging Stuttgart I mean, in, in the same way as you would a top four club, I don't think, because they've not been there in so, so long. Um, and especially also given what happened in the summer, you know, they lost their captain, Wataru Endo, with like not that much of the, the the summer remaining, they weren't expecting to sell him. It was only because of Liverpool, you know, losing Fabinho and Henderson, which also was not in their plans this summer, um, that they ended up going for Endo and missing out on other targets as well, of course. Um, but they also sold Borna Sosa to uh, Ajax. They also so uh, sold Mavropanos, of course, to West Ham. Three, you know, may, maybe Huge their three player. best players. Um, they made almost 50 million euros off them. So great business in that sense. Tongi Koulibaly, who was a, a real star for them a couple of years ago as well. He was released. Still yet to find a club, by the way, Tongi Koulibaly. So I, I'm, not, not, I'm not an expert on his situation, but that does puzzle me. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and, th and those three kind of, key players that they did sell you know, they've all moved to clubs that are playing in Europe this year um, which is your testament to Stuttgart's 
um, ability to rear talent. Obviously, they 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 have a history of it. You know, Timo Werner probably the most high profile in in recent years to come through that academy. But not only that, there's also been a lot of transition behind the scenes as well, um, which would suggest that this should be a bit of a transitional year for them. Sven Mislintat, you know, the famed recruiter who was their sporting director previous at Arsenal and Borussia Dortmund. Dortmund was where he really had his success, wasn't it? Um, he left in November of last year. Um, long-time manager Pellegrino Matarazzo uh, was sacked in October after failing to win any of his first nine matches. Bruno Labadio was eventually brought in as his permanent successor, but then he was sacked in April um, with them sitting bottom of the table. And Sebastian Hernes was uh, was hired, and I think he won three out of his final eight games. He only lost one, which given they only won four, I think, before that, was pretty remarkable. Um, and yeah, stayed up by the skin of their teeth in the end. Um, and interesting that, yeah, like Hernes left Hoffenheim, mm. um, Matarazzo is now Hoffenheim manager and doing a pretty good job this season as well. Um, that merry grand of Bundesliga managers. Grand, yeah, it's just, it doesn't stop. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting with, with Hernes, you know, he's got, you know, I think this is a big job for him because he left Hoffenheim. That was his first real major job. He'd been working in the Leipzig in Bayern Munich, coaching setups for four. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, he's actually the nephew of Uli Hernes. Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, th- this feels like a real statement from him. You know, he's instantly brought about improvement there in terms of what he was able to do at the end of last season. And actually, despite a relatively quiet summer in which, yeah, they, they sold a lot of talent, but didn't didn't really bring that much in. Mm. Um, so they've got a new sporting director, Fabian Volg- uh, Volgemuth, sorry. Um, just had to look that up um, to get that pronunciation right, hopefully. <laughs> um, he was at Paderborn before. Um, you know, did, yeah, didn't really spend that much this summer. Sohu Girassi, his um, contract was... Yeah, well, he is, yeah, is the GOAT right now. He, uh, you know, he, he was on loan last year and they made his you know, option to buy um, permanent from Ren for €9 million. Euros. Already has 10 goals after six games. He's matched Lewandowski's record for, uh, you know, a goal scoring start to the season. Came very close to it on the weekend as well to making it 11 from six uh, with that header that hit the bar. So, um, so yeah, he is on absolute fire. None of those goals are penalties, by the way. So I feel like probably that, that, Lewandowski, spectacular yeah, that, well. that Lewandowski record probably did include some uh, He's going for the 41. So he is. He's, he's going for it. He's going for it. Um, the new Gerd Müller. Um, <laughs> but they were also able to get Alexander Nubel in uh, mm. on, on loan from Bayern. Had a bit of an off year, actually, for Monaco last year, but he's been very solid so far. Um, and Angelo Stiller, who's someone I didn't really know before, um, but he was at Hoffenheim. Bit of a bit part player there. Uh, but 22-year-old defensive midfielder, came in for 5.5 million. Um, he's already a real key player in the Stuttgart side. Has worked with Hernes before at Hoffenheim and at Bayern Munich. Um, over eight progressive passes per game so far this season. Decent tackle numbers as well. So he's been... Really, their um, their kind of key distributor, the, the the guy who's been kind of kicking off their attacks, um, and yeah. But aside from those, there's not really been huge incomings. Dennis Dundavson on loan, he scored twice on the weekend off the bench, but so far hasn't played that much. Um, Pas- uh, Pascal Stenzel has been really good at right back, bit part player of the last two years, but now looks like a real first team player. Already has three uh, three assists. Um, so yeah, he's he's kind of working wonders with a squad, um, which if anything is is slightly depleted. Um, I know Giasi is in the in the form of his life, um, but you know you have to put that down um, to his management. So yeah, I think you have to give so much credit to Hernes right now. Yeah, he's absolutely killing it. And it was interesting that a few years ago, everyone was talking about Silas as really their attacking weapon. Mm. Actually, they've got so many other options now. But I was wondering, McCubbs, having done a little bit of a deep dive on them, you know, today and yesterday. Where do you think they could finish? What is realistic for them this year? Um, I think they can finish top half. I, I, I mean, who knows? Like the, the Bundesliga has had a number of you know unexpected teams vying for top four places in in recent years. Um, you know, look at Union last year. Look at Freiburg the year before. Glad back a couple of years ago as well. Wolfsburg, yeah, I think. and Stuttgart. Let's remember are one of the historic big clubs in Germany. So, um, I, I yeah, I think I think they're well worth top half finish. I think they can go for Europe. Like their performances so far have have been great and like I said they've not been against the toughest opposition when they came up against Leipzig they were turned over but um 
like all the underlying numbers look really good. I think they're a really, really good footballing side. So yeah, I think I think they should be aiming for a Europa League finish. Why not? Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Aim for the stars. Am I right in also thinking Joshua Kimmich came through the yeah, Stuttgart Academy yeah. as well? So him and Werner, very impressive recent history. Right, let's move over to Spain now because up until, well, it's pretty much this weekend or last <laughs> weekend, Gerona were doing exceptionally well, Henry, and they still are. But mm. what has been the secret of their success? Yeah, right. For, I think, a week, they were top of La Liga for the first time in their 93-year history, which mm. they were getting very excited <laughs> about. No, you're right. It's brilliant. Um, one six, drawn one, lost one from their eight games so far and again I think they've been really good value for money this was not a team that was had a problem scoring goals last year I think they had like the fifth best attack in La Liga we, we enjoyed watching them I think they hit six in one game yeah, last mm-hmm. year there was lots of multi kind Tati of, Castellano scored four in one game yeah. lots of multi-goal games going on uh, last year and they ended up finishing 10th which was a huge result for Girona considering they've been promoted the summer before Obviously, that success does come with a cost. Uh, we, we end up seeing Romeo t- taken by Barcelona. Castellanos, who was their top scorer, uh, bought by Lazio from the parent club, New York. Uh, and then uh, Santi Bueno, he, he's gone to Wolves. And Rodrigo Riquelme, he's gone to um, Atletico. So that's four guys who played at least 33 games in their squad last year taken from them. They did spend about 22 million euros in the market, which so they were willing to be a bit expansive. Yangel Herrera, he's been such a regular mm. in La Liga for a number of years. They've benefited from their link up with they're owned by the City Football Group, owned by sort of Pep Guardiola's brother, Pierre, mm. was it Pierre? Pierre, 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 yeah. Pierre? So yeah, which is which is you know an intriguing link to say the least. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Daddy Blind, we saw him go in there too. Porto and then Artem Dovbik, who what we both picked. You yes. love Dovbik, you guys. Yeah, we both picked him to be our like player <laughs> to watch this year, and he's got he's three been goals. So important for them. He's yeah. got three goals <laughs> so, so far. That's really satisfying to see. Porto was also really good for Real Sociedad for a number of years. Yeah. He was, he was. I think he was at Getafe last year and sort of dropped off. But yeah, like a really solid La Liga mm. player. Uh, through the door there. And yeah, they've kind of kicked on where they were left off last year. They've scored 18 goals uh, so far, which is just behind Barcelona. Uh, Stuani's coming in with goals again, sort of uh, old legend uh, back there. I think to Shankov, he's been so effective mm. on the wing. But then it's Savio. He's the guy that everyone's getting very excited about in Spain. He's a sort of a young winger on loan from Troyes, uh, another City football group team. Two goals and four assists this uh, season so far. He's second in La Liga for successful take-ons and progressive carries. He's just a super dangerous, exciting player. They play in this 4-1-4-1 system. They've got this very like dedicated central defensive midfielder who does the hard work, and then they just explode going forward. And yeah, they've just been such a pleasure to watch so far. Like Their victories have all admittedly come against teams that were in the bottom half of the table throughout the campaign so far. But still, it scalps against Sevilla and Villarreal in that time and now they've got a run of games get this against Cadiz Almeria Salta Vigo Osasuna and Rayo Vallecano who are doing okay again must mm. be said but they're just they've, there's, if they can have a solid run like this they could finish really high uh, this year and against Real Madrid I thought last week they were actually quite impressive I think they took the game to Madrid at points yes it finished 3-0 but that was more to do with them not taking their chances than anything uh, in, that, in, that, um, in that game and I think huge credit to the manager, Mikel. Uh, mm. I must go to him. Um, a legend at Rio Vallecano, got them promoted. I think he also got Huesca promoted. Uh, the, he's been at uh, Girona now for almost 100 games. 45% win rate is really strong. Really solid, he's impressive. dedicated himself to learning the Catalan language. So he made that very important early doors to kind of instill that um, sort of local connection within the club. So, you know, he's not from the Catalan area, but he's dedicated himself to learning that. And I think it's really important to mention they've had the same sporting director and president since 2015. So they're a team with sort of stability at its core. They've obviously got great ownership, don't they, which they benefit from uh, immensely. Jan Cotu as well going there uh, this season. So, yeah, Girona, I think, could be genuinely in for a special campaign. Um, Certainly with Sevilla not doing very much and Villarreal going backwards, uh, Betis there or thereabouts like there's the, some of the normal pretenders but I think Girona have a huge opportunity to get European football which would be huge in itself whatever competition they end up stumbling into yeah I love that love that some of the big La Liga accounts that I follow on Twitter have been saying that they play the best football in Spain which mm. is uh, which is go. quite a 
record um, at the moment. But um, yeah, let's see if they can keep it going. Right, let's have, head over to France now to Ligue 1, where there's another team, a slightly unexpected team, top of the table in Monaco. Now, obviously, they won the title a few years ago, but they did have that enormous dip. And they actually ended up finishing 17th in that 18-19 season. That was the season where Thierry Henry was in charge mm. for a little period as well. <laughs> uh, but their four, four years sorry, since have drastically improved on that. They've gone ninth, third, third and sixth, which is actually pretty good consistency because considering they've been through, I was having a look at it, a lot of coaches in that time as well. So Leah Hardim came in, he sort of steadied the ship once again. Then they went through Robert Moreno, Nico Kovac, Philippe Clement, and now they've got Adi Hooter. And the main issue holding them back last year was their defence. They conceded 58 goals, which was the 14th best record in the division. Adi Hooter also... You know, he arrives, he's got this very solid reputation, except for a spell at Gladbach. He's been a success pretty much wherever he's been, be that Salzburg, Young Boys, Frankfurt, then didn't last very long at Gladbach. But uh, he's done really well. And considering they lost another key player in the summer in Axel de Sassi, who goes to Chelsea, uh, Kevin Volland was also sold, you know, to, uh, to Union Berlin. He actually didn't do that well at Monaco, probably as well as people expected. But he was there for a number of years, probably a little bit outshone by oh, Ben. He got 14 in one of his seasons. He got, OK, he did OK. But compared to Ben Yedder, he was he was very much like the foil. He did fine. Um, but yeah, they I think they strengthened really well in the summer. Salisu came in, Zakaria as well in front, who'd played under uh, Hooter in the past at Gladbach as well. So they had that sort of inbuilt relationship. Uh, and they also spent 30 million euros on Falaran Balogun, which has proved to be pretty sh- shrewd business so far. And so far, so good. I mean, no one in France has been amazing. Uh, I mean, Monaco are top. They've won four of their seven games. They've drawn two. They've lost one. But they have been really free-flowing going forward. They've scored 18 goals in seven games, which is really, really impressive. The top of Ligue 1 on goal difference ahead of Brest. But there are six sides within three points. So it is a crazy tight league at this very, very early stage. Last weekend, they beat Marseille 3-2. They've also stuck three past Lens, who, you know, having Arsenal seen, Arsenal fans watching this will appreciate that Lens aren't an easy side to batter. And the only issue going forward for Monaco is that they have lost some key players. Like Brie Lombolo injured himself before the start of the season with a cruciate ligament injury. Kyle Enrique, their left wing back, started the season exceptionally well. He's now done his cruciate as well, which is a real, real shame. But the numbers suggest that they could definitely finish in the top three. Um, Maybe that's a little bit punchy with these injuries, but definitely top five, I would say. And they're improving across the board as well. So last year, they were 11th possession per game, they're now fifth. Their pass accuracy has gone from the 12th best to the 8th best. Their shots per game have marginally improved, but they've gone from the 16th best defence in terms of shots against per game to the third. An incredible turnaround, especially considering they lost another key defender in the summer. Um, but yeah, that's made a massive difference in their expected goals against. It's gone from 1.5 to 0.96, which is the second best in France behind Nice as well. Adi Huta, known for playing a variation of 3-4-3. He's done the same at Monaco. He's often used 3-4-1-2 as well with Minamino in the hole. He's also unearthed this guy called uh, Achille Chouch. My, my friend's pronunciation has never been particularly good, uh, but he's done really, really well. He's got four goals and assists uh, in just 122 minutes. Balogun's got two goals already from eight shots. He's being sort of eased into the team. Ben Yedda, less said about what's been going on behind the off the pitch about him, the better. You know, hopefully that you know gets to gets resolved before too long, but. He's once again, you know, playing quite well. Uh, and, and a midfield of uh, Zakaria and Yusuf Fafana is one of the strongest, I think, in France as well. They've also, shout out, uh, unearthed another young centre-back, <laughs> shock, uh, called Mangasa. And he leads the side for blocks, tackles and deceptions and clearances. And he's playing at the centre of Hutter's back three as well. They've got no European football as well. So I think a top three finish is very, mm. very possible for Monaco. And I would like to say that I picked them as my dark horse before a ball was kicked. I picked them as a flop, I think. I think so, you did, uh, yeah. yeah. I've been proved wrong. You did. So far. But, so I, far. you know, I think that I also... That was, that was another shocker that I got wrong. Villarreal, actually, I did pick them to go wrong. But I, there's a side that's been doing very well this season that I said that would flop. So, basically, none of us are experts. But we're having a good time making a fist <laughs> of it. Uh, <laughs> Henry's an expert, OK? He can be the expert. Uh, Henry, we've also got some other sides down here. I think you wanted to talk about Brest and Ronce, Well, Well, as you mentioned, I think Ligue 1 is a bit wild at the moment in the top four it's category. Crazy. 
I won't, I won't, I won't, I'm not going to sit here and say I've watched loads of breasts, but you know, they deserve respect. Four wins, two draws so far, beating Lens, Lyon, Le Havre, you know, the L beaters as well. Um, <laughs> boringly. <laughs> Delivering moving. L's to the L team. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> there you go. Yep. And they've beat Rance. And they got draws with Ren and Nice. Like, that's a really good start to the season. Excellent isn't start. it? I mean, they've only scored eight goals um, so far, but only conceded six, which is behind Nice. So they've got really sort of solid defence and, you know, it, I think Pierre Lee Melou could be the new Benjamin Andre mm, from what I've seen so far in his numbers. Uh, 30-year-olds. He uh, was at uh, Norwich a few years ago. Was he? Yeah. Wow. I remember him yeah. in their season that they came up and then they quickly went down with him. Well, he's on to brighter things uh, <laughs> to, the, to the looks of it. Uh, yeah, he's a huge block tackle interception numbers all amongst the 10 and clearance all amongst the top 10 percentile of players in Europe at this moment in time so he's proved to be so important in the middle uh, Roman de Castillo he's got three goals two assists so it looks like most of his their creative play going through him but then I think the one really worth looking out for is Bradley Locco who's a 20 year old left back the French left back they signed for half a million euros from Reims he's got he's first for crosses into the penalty area in Ligue 1 third for tackles one and, and third for successful take-ons so far so as signings go that's pretty pretty good value for money uh, Bradley Locko at press so yeah you know what I, I don't back them to stay that high but they've put themselves in a great footing to have a good campaign which for a club like Brest it's all about just sort of being secure as early as possible so they can plan their summer um, ride the but, waves baby yeah but I think Rans will still he's still there and he's taken them to new heights and I think that's so really Thompson. cool that's really cool because losing Balogun when he was so exceptional last year is is difficult, isn't it? And you, we've seen it before where teams capitulate when they lose their star striker. But not Rance. They're in third at the moment beating Isn't Clermont, the Montpellier, Leon. Lille I and I Lyon. I the against Lyon. They absolutely nailed them. Yeah, mm. I mean, they're, 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 they're a smart team. They actually spent 49 million euros this Did summer, they? which is quite a big, yeah. quite yeah. A big expenditure. Uh, they've got, they don't take loads of shots but they're so clinical that I think they've got the most set piece goals only Strasbourg take more efforts inside the six yard box than them so they're pretty clinical at getting into like the danger zone which is actually what we saw with Balogun a lot last year but they kind of instead of trying to replace Balogun outrightly they've sort of spread the goals amongst the teams eight mm. different scorers so far including three goals and two assists for Teddy Teuma who's a Maltese forward they signed from Union saint gilois for 4.6 million euros. Shout out Maltese. Which, yeah. <laughs> Things I, are looking I, up, Maltese people. I actually didn't even recognise the flag. I was like, <laughs> who, who, where's this guy come from? <laughs> so that's really cool. Mohamed Darami, they signed from 12 million euros from Ajax. He's got two goals, one assist, so not many minutes either. But it's actually other guys in the squad that have set, stepped up. Junior Ito, Azor, Matusiwa, a central defensive midfield. Yeah, I'm just really pleased. They play 4-3-3. It's just, you know what, the thing was with Will Steele, there was obviously that great hype, that great excitement. So sort of on that, he was on that player, that coach's tribune thingy, yeah. uh, talking through his tactics. And there was a slight worry in my mind of, oh God, you know, there's going to be so much hype about this guy and he could just get fired in, in an instant and it might not all be what it's meant to be. But he's kept going and he, if anything, he's made the better, tighter this season. And yeah, Rance, Rance could, I'd back them over Brest to have a bit of a better season. Also, Josh Wilson of Esperand, he's on loan there from Manchester City. Ooh, fingers yeah. crossed. He hasn't played loads of football. Rated. Exactly. Fingers crossed from like an English perspective that he can um, sort of get more minutes and show what he could do because as we've seen with Balogun, you know, go on to bigger, greater things. Rass play Monaco this weekend. Ooh. So first v third, that's a huge clash and I think this will be a real test to see just where they are this season. But I back Rass to at least get a point in this game. Love it, love it. Very quickly, McCubbs, we've got a couple of other names down here. Fiorentina, Sporting CP. Do you want to yeah, those? Fiorentina have been, yeah, been really, really solid. Um, I mean, they actually had a, a much better second half last year, didn't they? they? Ended up finishing eighth in the league, reached the final of the Coppa Italia, obviously reached the Conference League final too. Um, and yeah, they, they, I think they were, yeah, probably somewhat underrated, Um last year uh, because they ranked really well in terms of their underlying numbers in Serie A. I think they were third for shots. Uh, I think no one conceded fewer than their 9.1 shots a game as well. Um, but yeah, that just that poor start really, really set them back. Otherwise, I think they would have been uh, real hard challengers for the top four, um, especially given the kind of inconsistencies of clubs like um, Atalanta or of Roma. Like, I think they could have definitely sneaked into fourth or fifth. Um, and also, yeah, they lost a lot of key 
um, assets in the summer, didn't they? Especially Sofyan Amrabat, um, Luka Jovic, I know wasn't like a huge key player. I know Arta Cabral as well wasn't exactly, never took off in the way that, mm. you know, I, certainly I thought he was going to. Um, but this summer, you know, they have done good business. Now, you know, Maxime Lopez, although he's yet to play, actually really, I think he's only made one start so far, uh, was brought in as soon as Amrabat left which you know for a deadline day kind of move that could have been um yeah that could have been catastrophic but maxime lopez i think is absolute quality uh one of the more underrated midfielders out there to be Quite honest as well loaned him yeah yeah um they always do that kind of stuff they though, love a loan yeah, don't they yeah, yeah. yeah it's just like they did it with locatelli exactly, yeah because yeah. he is yeah because he is quite he was quite important to them and was even i mean he's he maybe just hasn't lived up to the hype that he originally had when he was like a 19 year old in at marseille mm. you know when he was kind of putting up 12 assists and making seven tackles and interceptions a game or something um, but uh, but I think yeah I think Maxime Lopez could could work really well under Italiano um, at Fiorentina um, Nico Gonzalez has had a really good start to the season important they kept hold of him obviously there was a huge interest was it from Brentford yep. um, in his signature I really really like Nico Gonzalez um, got a new deal signed a new deal yeah so um, so that's a big win for them um Giacomo Bonaventura has has started in great form as well. I think he's Jack like 34, 34 years old now. Um, yeah, um, they've yeah won four of their seven games. Yeah, they they just look really um, really good. I mean, they've probably been quite fortunate in front of goal. They've scored fifteen from seven point three xg, um, so they're probably getting a little bit lucky in that sense. But but yeah, you know, given the starts that we've seen from Lazio, given the starts we've seen from Roma. Fiorentina, I think, um, couldn't have made much of a better start. Really, they're they're right up there. So, um, so yeah, another team who I think should really be aiming for Europa League football this year. Um, I know they're in the Conference League, um, but yeah, they they should definitely be a Europa League side. Just quickly, stat I saw the other day: in 113 games in Serie A, how many different formations, how many different starting 11s do you think he's put out? Uh, Italian, I, reckon, I, reckon quite, I reckon quite a lot. 113. He's he's, he's had never a, changed. He's had a different starting eleven every wow. single game in charge of Fiorentina. It doesn't surprise me. That does Love not that. surprise me one bit. There's been so, especially in the forward line. I They've feel had like so many d- I feel different like, players. He's yeah, great. I feel he's like I feel like, striker, I feel like there's always a different striker. I feel like there's always a different striker. I, I, little I prediction. I think if one of the top four managers in that loses their job in the next eighteen months, it'll be Is him it? and Deserbi being like yeah. top candidates. I was, yeah, yeah, I was thinking maybe Mourinho if he goes, they could go in. Mm. A big stylistic change, but maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, briefly, let's touch on Sporting CP. They were actually quite disappointing in the league last year. They finished fourth. That was their joint lowest finish in the last 10 years. But they did make some shockwaves in Europe. They finished third in that Champions League group, which also had Spurs and Marseille in that sort of group of death last year, which compared to the group of death this year, doesn't look that deathly at all. But either way, they dropped into the Europa League. They got to the quarterfinals, I believe. Lost to Juventus, but they knocked out Arsenal, of course, in that game that derailed Arsenal's title hopes. Uh, and in the summer, as Sporting and Benfica and Porto tend to do, they lost a number of their key players. Ugarte obviously went to PSG. Porro permanently left uh, to Spurs. Chimiti, not such a permanent, you know, not such a star there, but another f- healthy fee came in for him. And Thiago Thomas as well, quite an underrated left back, uh, went to Wolfsburg. So they made a 70 million euro profit, but they managed to sign Victor Yorkres, who I thought was an amazing signing for a club like Sporting to manage to persuade him to go there over the you know the likes of the Premier League clubs that were looking at him. I thought that was a, a real coup. Uh, Martin Schulmund, who's very highly rated defensive midfielder. Ivan Fresneda, who's been linked with Arsenal and Barcelona in the past. Uh, and Trincao, who's you know used to be at Sporting. Uh, and they're six wins from seven. They're top of the Premier League. It's really tight at the top there. But I think they're due in for a, a good season. And York has started really well. Five goals, two assists in six league games. Re- you know, fair play for going there. I absolutely love it. And watch out for their two young centre-backs as well. Gonzalo Inacio uh, and Usman, uh, Usman Diamande. Sorry. Um, they are very, very highly rated and uh, incredibly exciting players. Uh, so, guys, that is our rundown of the secrets of those underrated clubs around Europe. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We always talk about the big ones, so we wanted to shine a light on some of the more underrated ones. Let's move on to our big match predictions. So, last week's predictions, there was no McCubs because he was sunning himself in Marseille. Uh, but it was myself, Pat and Henry in Barcelona versus Sevilla. We all backed a thumping Barcelona win. It was only 1-0 thanks to Sergio Ramos's own goal against Barcelona. 
Oh, mm. Tough for him. But one point to all of us. Uh, Barn versus Leipzig. Henry went 3 2 to Barn. Pat and I both backed the Desmond, and it was 2 2. So for the second time this season, I backed the 2 2 in a game involving Bayern. And it was three points to both of us. Lovely stuff. Uh, Milan versus Lazio. Henry and I went 1 0 to Milan. Pat went 2 0. It was 2 0. So one point to myself and Henry and three to Pat. So last week's scores Pat on seven. Really good week for him. Uh, although I would say that he, yeah. He, he did have the he, just the luck, he was copying yeah uh, I got five and Henry got two but the real leaderboard the one that everyone cares about restarts this week my Cubs 13 you're on growth Big. form it's been a while but you're back yeah I can't even remember what the, the result would have got me to 13 no but yeah, no. So a few perfect happened. scores I think yeah. you might have had three this season uh, I'm Lovely on 10 stuff. and Henry work to do on six yeah. Henry let's kick that off though let's get your work going Dortmund versus Union Berlin Saturday 2.30pm 4th versus 11th there's eight points between them at the moment. Henry Dortmund have a big game tonight yeah. against Milan. Union Berlin obviously not winning on Tuesday night. Mm. But how do you see this league meeting going? Uh, I'm pretty sure Dortmund are going to win this. I mean, Union have lost six games in a row. Um, and pretty brutal defeat in that Champions League twice now. Uh, and even lost to Heidenheim last week. Who, yeah. who team are up? pulling up? They, 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 <laughs> my dark horses. They were your dark yeah. horses, yeah. I said they were going to have a historically bad season and they've already won twice. So fair play to Heidenheim. I'm actually really happy for them and they look quite good when I watch them against Dortmund, incidentally. But yeah, Dortmund actually getting some really good wins. 3-1 away at, Hoff, um, at Hoffenheim. Uh, what was it at home? I can't remember. It was 3-1 against Hoffenheim last week. Hoffenheim have been playing well this mm-hmm. year. 1-0 victory over Wolfsburg. And then they, they beat Freiburg away in the Black Forest. So, you know, they're unbeaten so far. Four wins, two draws. Uh, Donio Marlin has picked up where he left off last year. Thanks so well. Playing really well. I saw links with Liverpool, apparently. Um, potential Salah replacement down the line is what mm. I was reading. I don't know if that actually works Dunno. stylistically. Marco Royce has stepped up again with three goals this season. Right, it's good to see Falkrug off the mark with one goal. One assist. Marco Royce just timeless, isn't he? Yeah, he's just unbelievable. Well, I wanted to ask you guys. Obviously, the big hoo ha about Jay Don Sancho this week. Um, mm. He's going to leave after the. They're both just not backing down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the little petty. Sorry, state of affairs. Yeah. yeah. Arno Gittens has just been given a new deal to 2028, which is great. Doesn't play a load of minutes. Do you think it's a good idea for them to go get Sancho or should they put. Faith in Bino Gittens. Or can you even see that Sancho move happening? Because apparently him and Terzic are like close and do talk. Um, mm. I think it's really difficult, isn't it? You don't really know what sort of version of Jaden Sancho you're getting. Obviously, if they get the somewhere close to the Dortmund Sancho, then that could be excellent. It could be a real cut price deal. The thing that if he's going to play on the right hand side, I just think Daniel Marlin's been so, so good in 2023. Like this calendar year has probably been, you know, he's really had its kind of explosion after a difficult start mm-hmm. at Dortmund. I think he's been excellent. So. I'm kind of sitting on the fence here. I'll go no. I think back Marlon. Yeah. The Cubs? Um, I would back Marlon on the right. I mean, but then Sancho can still play on the left and through the centre as well. Um, I think if I think if you're at a Bundesliga title race in January, there's there's no harm in, in, in adding someone like Sancho to your ranks, especially yeah, like a, a returning point. hero. Uh, you know the morale boost for Sancho would then feed into the rest of the side I think um, d- but yeah I think but really I think it more depends on like what was saying what version of Sancho are you getting are you getting a fully fit fully motivated Sancho or are you getting a, a Sancho who's actually really dropped off at United um, not necessarily just performance wise but like fitness wise like yeah. will will w- would would Sancho actually be able to come back to Dortmund and instantly be like yeah let's I'll, I'll give this team a lift like it's it's quite a lot to hmm. ask of him after what I think has been like a really steep decline in the last 12 yeah. months. I guess if he goes back, at least he doesn't have to be the main man straight away. At least yeah. they've got players yeah. ahead of him. But yeah, I get both of your points. That's our opinion on Jaden Sancho. Let's get back. That's, that's the thing with him though. Is like, if you do bring him back, like, is he going to be happy just sitting on the bench again? Because that's that's kind of been the problem, hasn't it? Like he's he, he's he's lost so much confidence from being from being snubbed. Well, I guess anyway. maybe maybe being in a place where he's got more positive memories. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Might 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 because it's not really worked. I remember when he left, United. people were like, he was. I remember. BBC do these videos called, I think they're called Eurofiles, and they do like five minute videos about European clubs and they interview fans and journalists. And I think it was a journalist that covers Dortmund said that Jaden Sancho was their best ever player when he left. Mm. Like he was wow. that yeah. good for Dortmund. I, yeah, I probably don't agree with that, but still, just go to show the strength of feeling there. Yeah, yeah they had Paul Lambert, let's not forget. Um, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's not forget. Yeah. <laughs> and Lewandowski, um, like, I mean, yeah. 
a bit of a being more serious. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Let us know what you think Sancho should do if Dortmund should get him. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, just quickly on Union. I don't really understand where it's gone wrong this year. They didn't lose any major first team players at all in the summer and actually spent 32 million euros. Uh, Robin Gerson's well. through the door. I mean, Alex Crown, that's fine. Voland, all right. Diego Lette, um, uh, people have been getting quite excited about him. But yeah, Hoffenheim, lost to them, lost to RB Leipzig, Wolfsburg, Heidenheim. It's just it's just gone a bit, a little bit wrong uh, for them at the moment. Schrado Becker, although he got a double in that Champions League game this week, he's, he hasn't really scored. He hasn't scored in the in the Bully so far. Kevin Behrens, he's on four goals. Yeah. Gerson's got three goals. Um, and they actually only concede the sixth fewest shots in the division. So they're just clearly conceding really high quality chances. I'm not sure Benucci's really fitted in that well so far. I think he's maybe taking minutes from players that he shouldn't be, in my opinion. Um, Danilo Doake is playing mm. really well again. But yeah, it's, it's I don't know. Dacho Fafana hasn't got off the mark yet. It's it's just something's not quite clicking for Urs Fischer. Obviously, they, they should stick with him. I think they will. And they just need—they just desperately need a result at the moment. But I just don't think it's going to come in this game against the Dortmund side that have only lost to PSG really this season. So I'm going to go for a comfortable two-nil victory to Dortmund. Fair enough. I was just thinking about other Chelsea loanies like Andre Santos isn't getting very many many minutes at Nottingham Forest as well. And the whole yeah. Chelsea philosophy relies on these young players becoming very good. Did so. you did you see Fabrizio Romano tweet that saying ten clubs are interested in him, but he's rotting on the bench? The first comment was like. Your, his agents blatantly just asked you to tweet this. Do you really? know what I mean? it, was such a, it was such a clear, like, yeah. Look, it's up to him to get in the Nottingham Forest squad. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, there is a lot of competition there as well. Um, yeah. What did you say? 2 0 to Dortmund? Yeah. Um, I can see Dortmund conceding, I think. Um, I might go 3 1. I was thinking about 3 1. Yeah, I might go 3 1 as well. 3 1 as well. There yeah, we have it. Uh, right, let's move on to Napoli versus Fiorentina. Sunday, 7 45 pm, third versus fifth. Level on points. We've already talked plenty about Fiorentina and the yeah. Cubs. Uh, but how do you see this one This one going? Um, I think this will be a Napoli victory. I think, um, you know, they played on Tuesday night, didn't they? Against Real. Um, Fiorentina uh, face Ferenc Farros mm. tonight, uh, as you're watching this, in the Conference League. So I think, you know, they're going to have two days less to prepare. Um, I think there's not a huge amount to pick between the sides in terms of their performances so far this season, but Napoli are coming off two games in which they've scored four in the league. Obviously, put two past Real as well. Osimhen two and two. You know that whole controversy um, surrounding those social media posts that were made about him. Absolutely ridiculous. I don't know what the club were thinking, um, especially in their response to you know the criticism. Um, absolutely baffling. Um, but uh, but he is yeah bang on form feature back on the score sheet as well in in recent weeks. Looking sharp. Um, so yeah, I think I think Napoli look look really good. Um, Fiorentina, I think yeah they they can go into this game with some confidence. I forgot to mention as well, Artur Mello. It's great to see him yeah. actually starting consistently um, again after you know years in the wilderness. Um, yeah, he he's looked he's looked yeah. pretty good. And Bala and Zola got his first goal off the bench um, on the weekend. Two, um, but they are missing some, you know, pretty key players. A dodo's out, I think, until next spring. I think um, with what I believe I think is an ACL injury. Yerry Mean is also out. So yeah, I think um, yeah, I just think Napoli are stronger. I think they'll, I think they'll um, probably win this. Be a tight game though. I think two one to Napoli. Really? I think, I think it'll be tight as well. I can see goals though. I'm going to go for three two to Napoli. Wow. Mm. I'm going to go for one one. <laughs> one one, fair <laughs> enough. Back down to earth. Okay, final game. Also at seven forty five, so you're spot for choice. Uh Ren versus PSG, sixth versus fifth. One point between them. We've told you how tight it is at the top of Liga. PSG are in action tonight as we film this against Newcastle in a game where I've got ten pounds on it with Joe Tomlinson. He's quite convinced that Newcastle are going to beat PSG. I just don't see it happening. I just don't see it happening. This could well, age go. horrifically. Uh, this could be the Critchley curse in action. But I just think PSG have got, just got so much individual quality. And I think, yeah, they won't be intimidated by a St. James's Park atmosphere. No disrespect to Newcastle. Everyone thinks I always hate Newcastle, but I, I really don't. I didn't grow up in the area. I don't hate them as much as I should a rival. Uh, but yeah, I just think they'll get beaten by PSG tonight, but we'll see what happens there. PSG, though, in the league have been quite disappointing. Could only draw 0-0 with Clermont Foot at the weekend. Uh, their goalkeeper did have an absolute stormer. Yeah, they're now fifth, but they're only two points behind first place Monaco. The season is not done. 
uh, and I do back them to improve as these 30 new players that they brought in, in the summer do slightly begin to click a little bit better. I think Mbappe, you know, seven goals, I think, in his first six league games. Hakimi's been absolutely excellent as well. Uh, they're the best side by expected points, but only narrowly ahead of Monaco. Like, they haven't really got going, but they're still in touching distance. But they're travelling to Rennes here. Um, Rennes play Villarreal tonight in the Europa League. So they get an extra day's less rest. Um, and they won their first Europa League game. So they'll be looking to continue a bit of momentum there. They're actually unbeaten in, in the league, but they've drawn five of their seven games. The most draws in Europe ahead of Nice. Mm. Yeah, there we have it. But they have unearthed a new talent. He's called Ibrahim Salah. Worth watching. Three goals in 158 minutes. Potentially the new... Mo Salah replacement when Salah inevitably goes to Saudi Arabia. Just bring in the next Salah. Uh, Callum Wendo started very well. Uh, and Benjamin Borrejo, who's such a consistent performer for them over the last few years, has been excellent once again. Uh, I might just go a quite tired performance from both of them after heavy excursions, but 1-0 to PSG, quite boringly. McCubbin? Uh, I might go for a PSG I loss, it. actually. I just feel like... Um, <laughs> it just feels like the, the start of the season, yeah, they, they've been a little bit unfortunate in games um, and uh, yeah I think Ren's, Ren's a hard place to go I'm going to go 2-1 Ren 2-1 two, one. Two, one. Yeah. Uh, since you told me that good drawing Ren fact I think I must back the draw so and back since my once maligned Desmond now celebrated <laughs> it's, it's winning it's won us so many points yeah I'm going to back my own Desmond maybe I'm just not good at calling the Desmond yeah. so Two two. Two it two. Is. Come on. He said it. Guys, that is it for Contenter Club for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Our discussions of underrated teams around Europe and those big match predictions. Make sure you get your big match predictions in the comments down below. Enjoy the champion no, enjoy the Europa League tonight. Mm. I hope the Wednesday games in the Champions League went really well. Unfortunately, we will try and film this on Thursdays in the future, but it just wasn't possible this week with my Cubs on TV. We wouldn't have time to film it and edit it before getting it out. But guys, thank you so much for watching. Go check out yesterday's team talk as well. All three of us were featuring. Lots of love. Bye. <laughs>